Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. On Twitter, Rob Collins asked me to address Douglas Adams' puddle logic. Since he helpfully provided me with a short video in which Adams succinctly explains the analogy, here we go. We always ask ourselves why, because we look for intention around us. Because we always intend, we do something with intention. You know, we... Um, we boil an egg in order to eat it. We don't look for intention because we do everything with intention. First, we often don't. People do all sorts of aimless things just for fun or out of boredom or to see what happens or for no reason at all. Indeed, one of the skills people develop as they grow up is being able to come up with plausible sounding explanations for the things they did for no reason. What we actually do is learn to recognize the mark of something done with intention. This is one reason why we're so good at recognizing when children are lying to us that they had some intention in what they did. One of the things you need to train your children to do is to act with intention. Um, so we, we look at the rocks and we look at the trees and we wonder what intention is here, even though it doesn't have intention. We wonder because these things have the mark of intention. That is, they work. The easiest way to tell the difference between something intentional and something accidental is that the intentional thing preserves a difficult balance in spite of the natural tendency of all things in this world to break down into an uninteresting homogeneity. If you doubt how difficult it is to defy that tendency, you need only look at all the rubbish thrown into landfills. And if you doubt that tendency, you need only look at the fact that we have landfills. Also, that the only two guarantees in this life are death and taxes. So we think, so what did this person who made this world intend it for? And this is the point where you think, well, it fits me very well. <laughs> you know, the caves and the forests and the stream and the mammoths. He must have made it for me. I mean, there's no other conclusion you can come to. This is a truly amazing bit of tosh. First, because nobody even mildly acquainted with what surviving in the natural world without modern technology is like can possibly think this. There are far, far too many things that will kill you if you're not careful. Second, because nobody acquainted with the ancient world would think that anyone back then did think this. They didn't. They were quite well aware that the natural world practically hated human beings. It's one reason why suffering and death visited upon man by the natural world was so plausibly because of human beings' sins. It happened so regularly. The revolutionary idea of the Jews was that the ruler of the universe actually liked humanity. Most everywhere else, you get the sense that those in charge of the world, that is, the gods, had a little appreciation for the very best human beings, so long as the best didn't get uppity and realized that they were still basically nothing. Because, after all, they were. The wail of Ecclesiastes that all is vanity isn't wrong. It's just an incomplete picture. This starting point of Adam's is simply absurd. The world is clearly governed because the world does not perish into a boring homogeneity. The world's governance clearly has nothing to do with our comfort, because absent modern technology, there's so very little comfort to be found in it. I wonder if Douglas Adams had ever been in a cave, or contemplated, for three seconds, perhaps, that they don't come equipped with doors. And it's rather like a puddle waking up one morning. I know they don't normally do this, but allow me, I'm a science fiction writer. <laughs> a puddle wakes up one morning and thinks, this is a very interesting world I find myself in. It fits me very neatly. In fact, it fits me so neatly. I mean, really precise, isn't it? <laughs> it must have been made to have me in it. Puddles, if one excludes the interesting things which live in them, are boringly homogenous and not capable of thought. Supposing one is, while keeping the boring homogeneity which renders the thought impossible, is just trickery. To be clear, this analogy is pointless because it has no relevant properties. The conclusions he's trying to draw come directly from the impossibility he's postulating. 
Like, for example, that the puddle doesn't know that it's conformable in shape to its surroundings. Why such a puddle should think itself rigid is never specified, because in fact, this is basically a human being implanted into a puddle without changing the puddle. That is, it's a simple contradiction, and as anyone even cursorily familiar with logic knows, everything follows from a contradiction. I will say that it's a clever sort of trick. Perhaps the young Earth creationists should tell stories about time-traveling atheists who, in order to make their atheism plausible, bred dinosaurs from chickens and then went back in time, planting their skeletons along with partially decayed bits of radioactive matter, to be dug up in order to convince their forebears that young Earth creationism is wrong. It's a perfect hoodwink! See? The Earth is only 6,000 days old! Of course, that conclusion doesn't follow from my silly science fiction story, any more than a conclusion about the design of the universe follows from Douglas Adams' silly science fiction story. If you want to be really charitable, you can turn this into a metaphor for the weak anthropic principle as an answer to the fine-tuning argument. But that's not being very charitable, since the weak anthropic principle isn't actually an answer, it's basically just hand-waving with a name. If you tried to apply it anywhere else, you'd just be laughed out of the room. It's unreasonable to ask who murdered this man, since you wouldn't be asking that if the man hadn't been murdered. Yeah. Okay. And the sun rises, and is continuing to narrate the story about this hole being made to have him in it. And the sun rises, and gradually the puddle is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And by the time the puddle ceases to exist, it's still thinking, it's still trapped in this idea that the, the hole was there for it. This bit doesn't actually add anything. Um, and the future atheist kept going back and planting more and more dinosaur bones in carbon-14 until eventually they died and then met God and realized their mistake. It's just a rhetorical flourish. And if we think the world is here for us, we will continue to destroy it in the way that we've been destroying it. And so we end with an environmental lecture. Amusingly, he's got this completely backwards. If the natural world was designed for us by an intelligence far cleverer than we are, we should spend a lot of effort to keep it just the way it is. If it wasn't made for us, then there's no reason to not break it, and every reason to break it and remake it to suit us. This whole thing reminds me of a meme I saw on Twitter a month or so ago. If you get your philosophy from a comedian, don't be surprised if it's a joke. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.